Hello there. In this video, we're going to describe the motion of a bead, which is loosely attached to a spinning rod. Right, so imagine that this thin rod is pinned at this little black dot that I made to the surface of like a frictionless table or something, right? The point I want to emphasize is this is like a, on a flat surface, right? We're not spinning like against gravity or something. And we're going to describe this with Newtonian mechanics. We're going to go ahead and kind of use this little five step program that I talked about in another video kind of the recipe to tackling Newton's law type problems. And so we're just going to systematically go through these kind of five steps to describe the motion of this little bead here, which can move up and down the rod. Okay, so we have this rod, it's spinning with some constant angular uh, velocity omega. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to find the degrees of freedom of our system. So we want to track this bead, right? So to find the degrees of freedom of the bead, we just use the formula D equals 3N minus C. N refers to the number of objects we're trying to track. C refers to the number of constraints. So of course we just have one bead, so n is going to equal one. How many constraints do we have? Well, we have a reduction in dimensionality. We're stuck in this plane of the page, so that's one constraint there. And this bead is of course trapped on this rod. So we have two constraints in total, right? So this guy's two, and so we simply have one degree of freedom. So let me put a little check here. We've done our degrees of freedom. That means that there's only one coordinate necessary to track the location of this bead. If we tried to propose more than one coordinate, uh, these wouldn't be independent coordinates. These coordinates would somehow depend on each other. So we only need one. So what coordinate should we use, right? So really what we're interested in, right? Because the kind of the theta direction is constrained, right? We have this constant angular velocity. So really all that we care about to track the bead's position is just measuring it up and down the rod, right? So all that we need, we're going to choose to track the bead's radial position. I'll call this R of T. This is gonna be the distance from the pivot point of the rod, which I've put at our origin. All right, so on to step three, we're going to need to define, right, what are the net external forces on my bead, and we're going to have to define a position vector, okay, in our given coordinate system. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean, right, we want to track the coordinate R of T, but to use Newton's laws, we need to define a vector to point to the bead. So I need to point to this bead with this position vector. I'm gonna go ahead and call this R of T with a vector on it though, not to be confused with the radial coordinate R, right? And with this radial coordinate, and I'm gonna go ahead and define a little unit vector, R hat, right? We can very clearly see that this R of T here is gonna be equal to R of T in the r hat direction. Do you see that very, very clearly? All right, so next let's go ahead and talk about the forces on the bead, right? And really all that we care about are forces in the radial direction, right? Because that's the coordinate we wanna track. Even if there's forces, right, like constraint type forces in the theta hat direction, well, we already totally know the motion in the theta direction. We know that this bead is gonna be spinning around with this constant velocity omega here, right? So all that we really care about are radial type forces. And it turns out there are no radial forces, right? This is a loosely bound bead. Wait, so hold on a second, real quick. If there's no forces on this bead, well, how is it going to move up or down the rod, right? What's going to cause it to kind of accelerate or have some non-trivial motion to it, right? Well, here's the thing, think about this, right? In order for something to move in a circle, you need a centripetal force pulling it inward, right? We know that. Well, what happens if you try to constrain something to move in, you know, the theta hat direction? We're trying to move it like it's in a circle, but we don't provide that inward centripetal force pulling it, pulling our object in, right? This bead is loosely bound. It, you know, it doesn't have this pulling force. 
Well, it's gonna move outwards, right? We didn't provide the necessary centripetal force, you know, to actually let this bead move in a circle. So it's actually gonna move outwards is what we're gonna see. So again, to conclude, we could write out, you know, our total forces on this bead, you know, in a very kind of conclusive way as like, we have zero in the R hat direction, Plus, if we really wanted to, we could add in a theta hat direction for completeness. We have, you know, potentially some theta hat directional forces, but we don't really care about those anyway. All right, so next on to step four, we're going to go ahead and write out Newton's second law for the bead. Let's put the forces down. We have zero in the R hat direction, plus some, you know, potential F theta in the theta hat direction. I'm just writing that for completeness. And this is equal to, sure, let's consider that the bead has some mass, I'll just call it little n, times the second derivative of our position vector. Oh right, our position vector was r r hat. We had this position vector in polar coordinates, right? Remind me, right, what is the second time derivative of a vector in polar coordinates. Well, fortunately, I left it in the uh, the coordinates equation sheet, left in the description of the video, right? So very generally, this second derivative is going to become r double dot minus r theta dot squared in the r hat direction plus 2r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot in the theta hat direction. That is the general expression for acceleration in polar coordinates, right? But again, we don't need to be totally general here. All that I care about is the motion, right? Up and down this rod. In other words, what's going on in the R hat direction only? So I don't need to worry about this theta hat stuff. Let's ignore the theta hat stuff, okay? I wrote it down generally so that we could, you know, correctly capture Newton's second law as a vectorial quantity. But now I just pull out what's going on in the r hat direction. So I say that zero is equal to m times r double dot minus r theta dot squared. We can immediately see that the mass m is not going to matter. We can get rid of that. And we're going to have that r double dot minus r. By the way, what is theta dot? The time derivative of our angle? Oh, right. We're locked in. We have a constant angular velocity omega. So theta dot is omega squared. And this is all going to be equal to zero. Very good. So now all of a sudden we have this differential equation. Let's write this out. d squared r dt squared minus r omega squared is equal to zero. We have a differential equation to solve for, you know, our coordinate r, our radial position up and down the rod. So great. So now I can really say that we're done with step four here. Now we just need to solve this equation that we've pulled out from Newton's second law. Great. This is a second order linear differential equation, right? I'm going to make a very common onsatz of, you know, that our solution R of t is of the form e to the alpha t, okay? And we have to figure out what is alpha, right? That's some unknown parameter, but we're going to figure it out. So this is a very nice guess to kind of guess the solution form of this differential equation here. So let's go ahead and plug this guy in. If we take two derivatives, I'm going to get alpha squared e to the alpha t minus, right, e to the alpha t omega squared equals zero. Oh, beautiful. Look, these guys are going to cancel out and we're going to be left with alpha is equal to plus or minus omega, which is great, right? This plus or minus here is, is exactly what we're looking for because we have a second order differential equation. We expect two linearly independent solutions. So one is going to correspond to plus omega. The other is going to correspond to minus omega, right? In other words, my solution R of T is going to look like 
for some arbitrary constants c1 and c2, c1 e to the omega t plus c2 e to the minus omega t. This is the general solution to this second order differential equation. Right, we have to write out the general solution as some linear combination of our two linearly independent solutions. Okay, very, very good. So we solved our little math problem. Now we're very close. Let's go ahead and think about what's the, you know, the physical significance of C1 and C2. Let's go ahead and impose some initial conditions. Let's go ahead and say that when we started spinning the rod, that maybe the bead at t equals zero, r at t equals zero, it was located at some, you know, some positive initial radius r naught, right? And, you know, maybe it had a radial velocity, you know, at t equals zero, it had zero radial velocity. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and, you know, use uh, these initial conditions and figure out what C1 and C2 would look like. So we're going to have r naught is going to be equal to C1 e to the zero is just one, okay? Plus C2 e to the zero is still one, right? So we have C1 plus C2 equals R naught, okay? And then the second condition here, zero is equal to, well, we have to take a little derivative, that's fine. We're going to have C1 omega, and we're going to have minus C2 omega, once we take those derivatives and plug in zero for t. Great. So we can see that, well, C1 and C2 are going to be equal from this condition here. And if they're equal, right, then we're going to have C1 is equal to C2 is equal to R0 over 2, right? You see that very, very clearly. And so now for this set of initial conditions, we're going to have that R of t is equal to R0 over 2 times e to the omega t plus e to the minus omega t. This is if the bead starts at some arbitrary radial position on the rod with zero radial velocity. Very cool. And by the way, what's kind of the long-term behavior? What happens if t goes to infinity? As t goes to infinity, well, this second exponential term here is going to die off, right? And this exponential term is going to blow up to infinity. So in other words, right, r of t, r of t is going to limit to infinity. It's basically going to blow up, right? And so eventually, you know, my bead will fly off, will fly off the rod. It's going to keep moving outwards until it flies off the rod. And so, bam, we can go ahead and check off step five. If you enjoyed this video, you know, let me know in the comments and consider subscribing to the channel. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.